and I welcome to this special edition of Sports Tonight. We're reaching you from our studios in Abuja, the nation's capital. I'm Austin Okonakwan. On the show tonight, we'll take a look at sports development in Nigeria. It's just about 165 days to the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. And I've been asking the question right from 280 days that already is Team Nigeria. Funding and infrastructure still a major issue to sports development in Nigeria. When Sunday Dari was appointed Minister of Youth and Sports Development, he says he wants to improve athletes' welfare. He says he also wants to improve infrastructure. He says they want to do things differently in the ministry. And so tonight on the show, we're going to be having the Minister of Youth and Sports Development, Mr. Sunday Dari, as we walk through sports development in Nigeria using our ready for the Olympics as a model. Welcome on board, wherever you are in the world watching us. This is Sports Tonight. Uh, it's not the same background you see on the show. Uh, it's a special edition, and tonight we want to give 100% focus to sports development in Nigeria. So wherever you are in the world, uh, you can be part of the program. Uh, feedback mechanisms, they're still the same. On Twitter, it's channels underscore sports. Facebook, channels I feel sports. So send us an email to sports tonight at channelstv.com. We've thrown out uh, that notification uh, telling you that the minister is our special guest. And you guys have been sending in comments. Let's keep it coming on Twitter. Channels underscore sports, Facebook channels, I feel sports. What are your thoughts? I'll be part of nation building tonight. What are the things we must do uh, to make sports a model uh, worldwide? Uh, one of the things the ministry also said they want to do is they want to make sports a business. It should be able to contribute to economic development in Nigeria. And that's why I want you to be part of the show. So uh, send us questions, comments, suggestions on ways that we can develop sports in Nigeria. So with that, uh, be part of the show. Twitter channels underscore sports, Facebook channels life in sports. Let's continue our countdown to the Edo 2020 National Sports Festival. That's one also an important a way to discover and nurture talent. And that's what we are doing with it right here in Nigeria. And it's a big, big project for the Ministry of Youth and Sports Development. 31 days to go. At those state government, they said they want to give us a different experience. They want us to see uh, the sports festival from another perspective. They want to give us the best event ever. And with that, they've been fixing infrastructure. They've done their own state sports festival. They've discovered talent. They said they also want to host to win. We love this one so much. And that's why we are counting down to let you know that it is coming, to so pump up your expectations. So on that note, welcome on the board once again. Let's welcome the Honorable Minister of Youth and Sports Development, Mr. Sunday Dari. Honorable Minister, good to have your sports tonight. Austin Okonapen, thanks for having me. Awesome. I, I don't know, he peeped, since he peeped into my wardrobe. <laughs> when we got the memo. <laughs> I know. Good to have you on the show, Honorable Minister. Thank and you. let's get uh, quickly into it with... Um, the National Sports Festival. We love the fact that it is back. Uh, what should we be expecting differently this time around? Well, you know, absolutely. The National Sports Festival built for Edo, called Edo 2020, come March this year, is regarded as Nigeria's version of the Olympics. We, we're going to be showcasing our very best in about 31 different sports. And we expect that what we're going to get in Edo will be a command performance. Nice. You've inspected the facilities there. Are you pleased with what you saw? Absolutely. I was there last week. That makes my third time of going to uh, Benin City at the Obwemuda Stadium. Um, I've seen tremendous improvement. I'll give an example. There's the indoor sports hall belonging to the Ministry of Youth and Sport. It's a multi-purpose sports hall. Three months ago, it was completely down, abandoned for like 10 years. Mm. The governor and the deputy governor promised they were going to fix it. When we went back last week, it was back in pristine condition. And it was used last week for the sports festival in Edo State. Mm -hmm. Back to the Ogwe Stadium, the transformation there is massive, unprecedented. It's like the old stadium was taken away and a new one was grafted. So we've seen the quality of the tartan tracks. We've seen the quality of the football pitch. We've had experts come in and go out. 
Um, the last time I went, I spent about two and a half hours going around. This mm -hmm. time I spent an equal amount of time. Um, so far, so good. Like I said, 90% were satisfied. We, we, their timelines already set. The governor on Monday released another chunk of, of money, which will help to meet the timelines. So as we count down to Edo 2020, we have timelines for the track, the final test for the pitch, the indoor sports hall, and all that is necessary. Mm, sounds good. Uh, let's talk about you for a moment before we get into the Olympics countdown. Six months it will be on Friday. Ah, questions on social media. Mr. Austin asked him, are you another football minister? Well, you know, I'm not even counting. I just wake up every day and I confront the challenge of trying to change the fundamentals of Nigeria sports development. Uh, that has been my overriding concern. But also, we've demonstrated in the last six months that we're not about football alone. Nigeria's sports development is anchored not just on one sport, on multiple sports. This is a country abounding with talents across the length and breadth of this country. And that's why we have made grassroots sports development, talent hunt, one of our core areas that we're going to look at. So we're not just about football. Football is king, I know. But also we realize that we have talents in boxing, in wrestling, in weightlifting gymnastics. Yeah. Recently we discovered that we also have talents in canoeing. Mm -hmm. You're looking at 28 different sports. The National Youth Games in September last year in Ilori was an eye-opener. We had 345 talents from 28 different sports. Real raw talents if developed in the next five years or ten years can bring glory awesome. and medals to this country. Awesome. So this country is beyond football. Mm -hmm. Football, yes, we continue to lead, but others. Look at Tokyo 2020, yeah. you have basketball, mm. the male and the female team. Awesome. That is unprecedented. And no football. And it's signposted the future of our sports development mm. that beyond football, other sports can bring glory to this country. That's right. So that's it's a confirmation from the minister. There is no football minister. It's sports development in Nigeria, and that's the focus for the ministry. Let's get to our countdown to the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Yes, that one is massive, and that's why we'll be doing this countdown 156 more days to go. The Ministry of Youth and Sports Development, they reminded us last week that they, are, they want to avoid the mistakes from the past. They want to do things differently. They want to make sure that athletes are fine. They, are, they brought up, they adopt an athlete initiative to ensure that a funding uh, won't be a problem as it used to be. 156 days to go. I used to ask the question on the show, how ready is Team Nigeria? I've got a minister is going to tell us tonight on the show. Uh, Honorable Minister, how ready is Team Nigeria? Nigeria is ready. Nigeria is ready for Tokyo 2020. Um, I can say that because, you know, they say the preparation for the next Olympic starts when the one you just finished ended. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about preparations, you're looking at two levels. The preparation at the level of the athletes themselves. Over the years, both the home-based and foreign-based have been at national meets and tournaments. They've been to continental. They've been to international so that they can get the points they need and get ready. So they've been preparing the last four years. What we now see is that state preparation that finally puts them where they want to be in terms of um, training, in terms of camping, in terms of the international championships they need to really attend to sharpen their skills. And I think this time around, what is different really is that first we're working very hard to make sure that our funds are released early enough. Mm. President Mahmoud Buhari has been quite supportive working through the Ministry of Finance. So like in the, unlike in the past, this time around we expect that the funds will be available perhaps another, in another 60 days. Mm. That would be a record release of funds. Mm. Beyond that, we have ruled out a number of initiatives, particularly the Adopt an Athlete campaign, which funds and supports the athlete directly. It is a hybrid of the grants for the athletes I have in the United Kingdom, uh, in South Africa, in Jamaica. And we've seen at least 15 of our athletes benefit. We have 57 of them. We hope that in the next 30 to 40 days, we will get each of these athletes adopted. Unlike in the past, we, we competed in about 22 spots. This time around, we put in a little bit of precision. Mm. We, we, we kind of looked at 
performances. We looked at their ratings, the points you have, and we decided, look, we're going to just compete in 11 sports. And that is informed by several, you know, reports that has happened over time. But the most important one was that report that came set up by President Jonathan, Presidential Tax Force, mm -hmm. that looked at our performance at the Olympics in, in, in London. You remember? We yes. came back with nothing. Mm -hmm. um, that was the turning point. And we've looked at that report, informed by development, you know, seeing what happens in other countries. We've decided that in 11 sports, we're going to compete. And we're watching very closely as they complete the qualifiers. Mm -hmm. It might remain 11, it might come down to 9. But we're determined to put our resources where we can best compete and bring glory to this country. I've said it repeatedly, the Olympics is not a trial. Countries don't go to Olympics to try out or for trials. If in the past we've tried, yeah, but this time around, we're going to compete with the best in the world. We're going to compete for the medals, the gold, the silver, and the bronze. And I, and I, I try to understand that, that point, but some federations will say if they go through the hurdles to qualify, uh, they, they can also believe they, they will go there to win. So such federations, what will be their story? Well, let me say, we've carried the federations along because we've had an informed process. We're talking about precision. We're talking about mining the data. You know, you look at it. If somebody is running, um, is maybe the fifth or let's say the tent mm. in uh, 100 meters hurdles for women. And um, you have three of the best competing. competing. And then you look at the time difference. You look at the time we have between now and the Olympics. From experience, can this person really close up? I'll give a, be a more ex better example, much better example. If our rating right now is 125 when it comes to boxing, mm. do you think we can really go to the Olympics and really win a medal? It's going to be tough. tough. So what we put together in metrics mm. is a database. You can mine the data. That's what other countries do. As we sit here today, the United Kingdom, for instance, can tell you with some level of precision, there's a number of medals we we'll win in this particular sport, in this sport, in this sport. Because... There's precision, they mine the data, they, look, they compare other athletes that will be there to run or to compete. We've tried to do that this time around, and we're, we're confident that the 11 sports we have chosen, Nigeria, we can compete. We have the talents, and these are well-known talents globally who have competed at some of the highest championships, both indoor and outdoor. Mm. Let's talk about the, the, the ADOPT campaign initiative. I was at a launch in Lagos, uh, and to some point, um, it looks like something that can work. But you mentioned that um, whoever is adopting an athlete, we deal with the athlete directly. Now, how would the ministry monitor that? And are there gains already? Absolutely. Um, well, the, the ministry, of course, is supervising the process. We have an MOU between the ministry and the person or the organization adopting the athlete. So we're managing the process. Okay. But what we've done is make sure that there's a direct organic relationship, the direct transfer of funds to the athlete. All the athletes have submitted, some are still submitting their plans because we need to see the plans that will justify the funds that will go to them. We also have a, a monetary mechanism to make sure that if you get adopted and you get the funds, the funds are used for the purpose for which they are meant. So we built in that mechanism, we have the MOU, and like I said so far, interestingly we've had more organizations, more individuals come into the ministry mm -hmm. to say, I want to adopt an athlete on the way to Olympics. So, so far it's been, um, it's been very uh, rewarding to see how we've seen a spike in the interest on the part of individuals and corporate organizations in our sportsmen and women. That is something we had set out to achieve. Beyond bringing private money, we want that Olympic spirit, the sporting spirit of Nigerians, to be awakened and to recognize the fact that the athletes that bring glory to this country deserve to be supported while they're preparing to go. Not wait until they win that medal mm. before we, rem we, we uh, remember to, to give them uh, plundits and awards. Sounds good. Let's talk about infrastructure development. That's been a major setback to sports development in Nigeria. I don't have to tell you about the National Stadium in Lagos. The National Stadium Abuja, 
problematic. Go around the country. How can we start fixing this problem of infrastructure? We have started. There are just, you know, various levels, various stages. You know, you're coming from ground zero, and then you're trying to make sure that you bring incremental changes. National Stadium, abandoned for well over 18, 19 years. Liberty Stadium, which is above Femi Awolo Stadium, abandoned for over 10, over a decade. Uh, the National Stadium here in Abuja is coming back gradually. You need to pay a visit to that place. I walk from the National Stadium two days in a week, um, and then the Amadi Bello Stadium. The story is changing, and I'll give you two quick examples. As we speak, I know that in October we got the engagement with uh, Alaji Dangote. I can tell you that as of last week, the process of documentation, getting the contractors has been completed. We expect that work will start to rehabilitate the national pitch in the national stadium. The floor lies in, in Abuja. In, in Abuja. Okay. As we speak, the governor of Kaduna State has agreed to fix almost 80% of this Amadou Bello Stadium in Kaduna. The main ball, the dressing room, media center, and all of that. As we speak, we have Chief Keshintian Adebutu, who has shown interest to say, I'm ready to fix the National Stadium in Surulere, Lagos. Of course, we're engaging for uh, the Obafemi Awolowo Stadium. So it's a process. You know, the adoption initiative has three flavors. Mm. Adopt a pitch, which is adopt a football pitch, because this is a football nation. And when FIFA tells me, you have just one FIFA standard, world standard football pitch in this country, Uyo, and that within a year, if Uyo is not maintained, it will go out of uh, that grading or reckoning. That, that worries you, mm. and that worried me immensely as, as, as a minister. So we came up with that idea of adopt a pitch, adopt a sports center, and then adopt an athlete. Those are the three flavors, and we've been able to leverage on that to start to change the fundamentals of our sports development. Mm. So, so how long would this take particularly? Uh, let's begin with um, Abuja. Um, the sponsor, is it about a member or a total fix of the stadium? It's about the member. Okay. When you also look at it, there are parts of the stadium that are very, still very functional. It's just that when you don't also use some of these sporting uh, facilities, they're going to easily disrepair. But when you go to the National Stadium on an ordinary day, particularly on weekends, you see about 150 people. The football pitches are being used. The hard courts for tennis is, is being used. Uh, and I think that when you look at a stadium, by the time you have the football pitch, you have the lights, you have the, um, the terraces um, working, the stadium comes alive. Mm. And that's why in a deliberate way we've targeted the football pitches, the tartan tracks, the flood lights, and the... And the of course, uh, the scoreboard to get some activity started in these stadiums across the country. Two years ago, Lagos, Lagos State Government showed interest for the National Stadium in Surulere. Uh, where are the talks with that? Well, that's true. But um, you know that about five years ago, an approval was received by the federal government to concession the National Stadium Lagos. Mm. And that process has been ongoing for a while. We've gotten to the last stage to come up with the bid document so that we can have Nigerians actually come out and bid for, uh, to, con you know, to bid for the stadium. Mm -hmm. But Lagos State, of course, did. But we've seen that going through concession mm -hmm. is the best option that we have. Um, the final hurdle is just to get the bid documents out there and they see the interest that will come. But what we're also doing is that beyond that, because it's taken five years after the approval to even get it to the final stage. We are also not um, eliminating the possibility of getting private individuals who can add a bit of value and get the stadium you know, activated to some extent mm. before we can have a concessionaire eventually come in and, and take over fully. So it's, uh, beyond that, the Abuja sports, um, uh, is it uh, where you have the, the athletes, the, the hostel, sports hostel, yeah. is also one of uh, the places we want to concession, and that is going to go hand in hand with the National Stadium as a, as a pilot to see how it works. But then, you see, we're not waiting for that. That's why we've come up with this adoption plan to have private individuals and organizations to adopt the sports center and, and the pitches to see what we can do, because this country can no longer wait. Like I told you, the, the rule cannot be different. The requirement cannot be different. Investment 
incentive, infrastructure and facilities, and policy. Mm. And we're working on all fours, particularly policy. Very soon, we're going to have a national sports industrial policy that would drive our sports development. And we've benchmarked. We've seen best practices, and it can be different. Sounds good. We're still policy. Sports tonight on your award-winning sports-loving channels, television. Let's go on this break. When we come back, what is that thing Nigeria must do to have it good at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics? Mr. Sunday Dari will tell us. Don't go anywhere. Stay. Welcome back to Sports Tonight on Channels Television Tonight. We're reaching you from our studios in Abuja. So take a look at sport development in Nigeria. We've got the Honorable Minister for Youth and Sports Development, Mr. Sunday Dari, and we want to understand the goals of the ministry, particularly in this Olympic year. It's about 156 days to the Olympics, and already this team Nigeria has been talking to us about that sport. Honorable Minister, I know there are a lot of issues, but if there's one thing we need to do, and then we'll close our eyes, go to Tokyo, and say we'll be fine. What should be that thing that we must fix? Well, I think, like you said, there are quite a number of things. But what we must prioritize is the funds. We need the funds in quick time. We need to also enlarge the base of the funds that we need. You know, they often ask, what is the goal that the Olympics worth? And I'll give you some indicators. The United Kingdom spent $77.6 million mm. uh, for the 1992 uh, Athens, in Athens. Ten years down the road, that increased to $460 million US dollars. Mm. If you look at the quantum of money spent in ten years, you look at the improvement the in sports development, you look at the number of medals you know, the UK athletes have brought, and then you compare that to Nigeria. We spent about $5 million in Athens. Rio de Janeiro, we spent it's an equivalent of six, $6 million. $7 million. Mm -hmm. You compete, you run on the same track. The timing is the same. The expectation the same. So it's about the funding. Critical. But also, it's not enough to have the fund. You must also have a plan. I can say this time around, we have a plan. We are focused in implementing the plan. We've borrowed from the plans of the past, but we've also tried to bring in a level of precision and laser focus on what really our goal is. A clear understanding of what the Olympics, the highest level of competition when it comes to sports. So you want to go there with your best whatsoever. But also, we realize that the athletes are the center and the core of that success story. And we've got to the heart of it. We're engaging them. We're interested in their progress. And we've seen tremendous improvement. Just last weekend alone, Ese Brumi yeah. had a personal best. Yeah. Ruth Usoro had a personal best. Tobi Musa, the huddles, had a season's best. Yeah. Obud, I can just go on. Then you have um, wrestling. Odunayo, oh, yeah. she's number one in the world now. Category. Category. So, we are watching closely, we are working with them, we are interested in their plans, we are providing funding where it's necessary. And by the end of the indoor season, which is sometime early April, and then we'll go to the outdoor season, we have our plans. As we speak, we've appointed two license officers in America and Europe to just monitor our athletes, to make sure they don't burn out, to make sure that we get support to them as quickly as possible. So we're paying very close attention, and I think that's critical. So funding? is critical. Welfare of the athletes is critical. Close monitoring, very important. Mm. And I love the fact that you mentioned the United Kingdom and what they did, but then again, they created an enabling environment to see sports as a business. What's your ministry, what's the ministry doing to create that environment so that we can start ripping the gains of our sports? Well, the starting point is trying to change the perception about sports, about sports men and women, about sports generally in this country. And I think we've succeeded in that in the last six months, trying to change the perception, the negative perception about sports, not just football, but mm. the whole arena of sports. And we said, look, sports is vital part of our system, and there's a need to focus on it. Sports in this country is not business. In other countries, 
that we talk about, United Kingdom, yeah. Jamaica, South Africa, America, even Kenya, sports is business, even Kenya. So we have started a process in which we've tried to develop a model around our sports development. We've worked with the NASG, yeah. and you'll recall that last year we had uh, technical uh, meetings in Abuja here. We broke into about 11 different uh, technical groups. We had the report come in. We signed an MOU with the organized private sector to develop finally a business model around our sports. We must move from having sports classified as just recreation to sports as business. Mm -hmm. You look at the possibilities, job creation for our, for our youth. You look at merchandise, industry, manufacturing. You look at what also comes to our athletes in terms of branding. You see, there's a template out there, and we're trying to make sure that we domesticate this, this template. As we speak tomorrow, we're going to have the SIWG that will meet again tomorrow. After that, we'll now start meeting at least 15 to 18 critical stakeholders that will be vital to developing a business model for our country. Our goal, ultimately, is to have not just a national sports policy, but a national sports industry policy. And that will eventually benefit the athletes because the corporate money that comes in, the sponsorship, the endorsement, will change the whole, the whole landscape of sports development in our country. Mm, sounds good. Uh, let's talk about some football now. We'll still go back to uh, the Olympics. Uh, Coach Genero, Super Eagles technical advisor, uh, gave you a visit. What did you guys talk about? Well, he wanted to first present me a jersey as a new minister. Um, because when he lost his mother, that was barely a week or two weeks after I, I was appointed Minister of Sports Development, um, I, did, I gave him a call. I sent um, a message to him. He wanted to come thank me about that, but also to have the opportunity to engage with me uh, uh, at a private level just to discuss. I thanked him for the work he has done so far. Yeah. We have seen improvements in, uh, uh, in, our, in our football uh, while he, he came around. Uh, but beyond that, we, we just stayed at the level of uh, saying that uh, we, we expect our team, the Super Eagles, to get better. But beyond that, we expect that uh, youth football development will also get um, a bit of attention. So it was more of a private, unofficial visit. And that's, that's it. Mm. So, has the NFF given you any update as regards its contract renewal? Well, um, I, I think when it comes to RA, uh, the, the NFF has been quite open. I've seen they've been out there. Amadjou Pinik has spoken at length. Um, his contract winds down in June. He will be given an opportunity for renewal. Mm. A couple of things will have to change. This administration is paying close attention and emphasis to the fact that we must have youth football development. That is non-negotiable. Mm. And if you have a super equals coach, that is committed to that. That's the kind of coach we need. We want feeder teams. We want team A, team B, team C. Those are, those are the standards. Yeah. We're not going to lower the standards any longer. With whoever is going to coach the Super Eagles must meet the high standard that the coach of United Kingdom, the coach of Brazil, meets. We're not going to lower that standard because we compete for the same cups. Yeah. And I think that so far, uh, an, an engagement is, is ongoing, and I, I want to give the NFF the benefit of the doubt because I've met with them. I've told them that the standard cannot be lowered anyway. We've also seen them open up the process, working with PwC. But as that is ongoing too, we will not shy away from head hunting because it's all part of the process. We just want the best for our football. With the documents available to you, is the Nigeria Football Federation transparent? Well, you see, I've just been there six months. Um, and um, if you want to isolate the issues, it will be difficult when you talk about transparency. Because if you isolate the issues, you're talking about financial transparency, you're talking about technical transparency, you're talking about a whole range of... But let me say, I have had a robust engagement with them. It's not been exactly rosy as the case may be. Recall, in December, Benin, when they had the AGM, I did not go there, but I sent my speech. Mm. And I think that speech 
was most critical from the very opening sentence till the last. Where didn't you go? Well, I, had, I was signing the MOU in, in, in Lagos with the organized private sector that morning at the NASG headquarters in Nikoi. But it was clear. I, I talked about the fact that our domestic clique is on, is on clutches. How do you invest? How do you sponsor when you don't even know, you don't have a proper calendar for the domestic league? Nobody's going to bring his money there. I talked about the fact that our football is in a coma. We can't really point to a youth development program. program, as the case may be. How do you talk about the perception of negativity that has pervaded football development in this country? And I said, beyond just meeting and just ratifying, there was a need to hunker down and deal with the issues had, you know, without, without really uh, hiding away or burying our heads uh, in the sand. So let me say this. Nigerians, many football lovers, expect an overnight success, an overnight change. Change is a process. The, what is important is that we've started to look at the fundamentals of our football development, the administration, the technical department, all the areas that are critical. We're looking at them critically. That's critical and that's important. So it's, it's going to be a process. The changes will come, sometimes in huge chunks, sometimes in little chunk, but it's a journey we have started and we're committed to see it through. Mm. Uh, former Super Eagles player Daniel Amokachi has been appointed ambassador. Uh, and I know your ministry uh, congratulated them, uh, congratulated him on that. Right. Um, are you also aware of uh, the reports that he's also been appointed head of technical for the NFF? Do you have any updates on that? Well, no. What I'm aware of is that uh, Mr. President graciously um, appointed him as a football ambassador after consultation with the ministry. Uh, we have seen that that announcement has been well received. Uh, we've been trying to get him to settle down in that role because that is a huge job. It's going to be help, helping us to oversee all our football teams, helping us to develop the youth uh, aspect of our football development. Um, so for me, that's what's important for me. That is my focus, that the assignment uh, is going to carry out strikes at the heart of football development. Mm. I want him to play that role critically. The ministry is ready and willing to provide him with the tools he needs to play that role. Also remember, beyond just Amokachi, he is going to also need a cast around him, a cast of former uh, inter ex internationals, coaches, technical hands, and the rest of them. He needs to bring this together to help serve, you know, to change the narrative. So as it regards any other role for him, um, I think right now his job is cut out. If, 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 if you know the kind of person I am, mm. I already have, you know, almost five pages of things I want him to, to do. How he's going to find time to take another job elsewhere, I don't know. So have you been informed of this new appointment? No, because for me, it's not an official. I've not been informed at all, whether directly or indirectly. Mm. I've not been informed. Let's talk about um, the code of governance in the ministry. Because if you look at from the AFN to now para powerlifting to the Rugby Football Federation, um, the fightings, the misunderstandings, is it because there's something missing in the code of, covenant, of governance or the federations are not just ready to obey rules and regulations? Well, you know, we're dealing with two sets of, uh, of laws here. They are the extant laws derived from the constitution of the federations. And then there is the code of governance, which the federations work along with the ministry to come up with. Mm. You see, where you, in a deliberate way, refuse to abide by your own extant laws and also the code of governance, you see this kind of crisis. You either have individuals who become extremely powerful, because part of that whole system is to set up an elective board. There are board members who are elected. Mm which means that they deal with the day-to-day -day running. So while you have a departure from running a board in a collective sense, as per the extant laws contained, then you see this crisis emerging. The ministry, as far as possible, has tried to walk the fine line, enforce the code of governance.
because there was an agreement. We have 38 sporting federations. The code of governors applicable to them is the same. They have their constitution in line with their international bodies. I'll tell you, for instance, Austin, in the last two years or so, the ministry has asked that every federation submit their constitution. Only seven out of 38 have submitted. Only two of them have had their constitution ratified. So when you have federations that do not really have a constitution per se, it gives room for some of the tensions that you see. You see, ultimately, the power and the success of the federation lies in a functional board. Mm -hmm. But where the board is not functional because you do not abide by the rules you have set for yourselves, it becomes a problem. And I said the ministry has a supervisory role. No federation can be autonomous of the ministry. No federation. No federation. They, they, draw, they, they draw funds. They draw funds from the ministry through appropriation, through the National Assembly. That's mm -hmm. one. The federations are a creation. Even the international body says that they only operate, they must operate with due respect to the laws of the country where they operate. Mm -hmm. So, and they operate as, you know, semi NGOs, but they draw their funds from the ministry. So no federation can be autonomous. Perhaps at some point we'll get to that stage in which the federations will come full-fledged NGOs, the government takes its money, they train their, their athletes, and then when it comes to entering them for international competitions, the government takes care of that. Perhaps we're going to look at that. We're going to look at a lot of ways in which we can fix what we see happening now. We've had the benefit of the federations running, We've seen what has created some anti-systemic um, developments within the federations. Yeah. And we're looking at what can be done. You're working with the federations themselves. But let me also say, you talked about just two federations. We have 36 or three federations. We have 32 others that are really functional. So what you see with a number of federations is the exception. And we're trying to deal with it so that it does not have a dominant effect on other uh, federations. As What's the ministry be. doing? What's the intervention plan? AFM, very critical, is an Olympic year. Yeah. Para powerlifting, cr critical, we have the yeah. Paralympics. Right. What, is, what is the ministry doing to call off this tension in these two federations? Well, we, the ministry will continue to insist that you abide by the Code of Governance to which every sporting federation signs to. The ministry will continue to draw their attention without interference, but we will intervene to say, you have a board. You can operate as a solo agent, as a sole administrator. Because even the board has a mind of its own. If you have a board of 13 people and two people basically take all the decisions, you know, that creates crisis. Mm -hmm. So we'll continue to draw their attention to it. But that's ultimately, ultimately, if we continue to have this, then the government through the ministry, we'll have to consider whether it will continue to give, offer legitimacy to such federations, or also to make government funds available. Mm. We'll continue to monitor that one because, of course, we need to fix these administrative issues if we want to move sports forward. Yes. Let's talk about the grassroots. Are there potentials there with what you've seen? Absolutely. And I've seen them. Great potentials. Just on Friday, Saturday last week, we had the All Commerce in Akure. The all commerce athletes made by the AFN, the Olamide uh, group. And we, we saw a lot of talent. We saw young Nigerians run personal best. In another 10 days, we were going to have the classics in Ekiti. Mm. We will see more of these talents prop up. And then we get to Edo 2020. But outside of that, there's a focus on grassroots sports development. We have what we call the Talent Hunt Program, the THP. It is a deliberate policy to hunt for talents, wherever they are in this country, whatever the sports. And in the last four months, we have seen, we have recorded a few discoveries. You talk about Shekinat, the little girl boxer mm -hmm. in Oro Shoki in, in Lagos. You talk about Adrian, the, the, the swimmer, who uh, is called the fish. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about the, the young sisters, Nene and Uzazi, mm -hmm. who are now you know, regarded as... Uh, uh, just like the Serena, the Williams sisters. And of course, I was in Bielsa last week mm. and uh, I learned about uh, Saoma. 
uh, Sports Academy. So I drove there. I stopped by. I was shocked to find 320 young kids, boys wow. and girls, between ages 9 and 15. Mm -hmm. They are in that school. They get fed three times a day. They also attend school, but also are engaged in sporting facilities, uh, sporting uh, activities mm -hmm. there. These kids are the future of our sports development. Mm -hmm. Austin, it is often said that the gold is in the child. That's right. I'll post you right there because we'll still continue with the grassroots. And by the way, I saw you juggling the ball. Right <laughs> Let's go on this quick break. When we come back, we'll still talk about the grassroots and the importance of having a policy that will guide sports administration in Nigeria. Don't go anywhere. Stay. Welcome back to Sports Tonight on Channel Television. We still have the Minister for Youth and Sports Development, uh, Mr. Sunday Dari, with us in the studio. And as we're talking about grassroots sports development, you said there are potentials in there. Yeah, of course. I did say, you know, the gold is in the child. And what is the story behind that? You must cultivate these talents at a very young age. So when you see an 18-year-old, 20-year-old, you know, breaking the records and smashing the records, it didn't start three years ago. It started when they were young kids, when their parents were taking them every day, every weekend to go out there and train. Mm. And you see the, the Williams sisters, you see the same boat. When he was young. And then you see school sports, he went through the school sports, you know, and all of that. And it can be different for us. In this country, in the past, we saw our talents, football talents, athletes, go through the inter-house sports, primary school, secondary school, and then up to when they really become, uh, they, they go to the elite club. We, we've seen a departure from that, and we want to return to that in a deliberate way. This um, time around, we're going out there under the Talent Hunt program to look for these talents. We thank a lot of Nigerians who have drawn our attention to say, we have these talents here. Shekinat, I didn't find Shekinat directly. Mm. I just found something that was sent to me on social media. And I followed through. Mm. And I found that, dude, there's really some gold here. Let's work with her. Look at the, the girls we met the same way. The boy who's a swimmer, the same way. I saw more that I went through. 320 kids just schooling in that quiet, serene environment. Education and sport, inseparable. These are young kids, healthy. They're playing hockey, football. I saw some of the wrestlers. Deep technical depth in wrestling. If you nurture this. So we're looking at a talent hunt program that will harvest these talents, that will nurture them, keep them in a nursery, feed them to our federations, and then the ministry will try to create a fund that will support not just their growth as sportsmen and women, but also their education. Sounds good. Let's go back to this issue of having a working policy. What can the, the ministry do to ensure that there is a policy that will guide development of sports in Nigeria? Recall, uh, and Austin, it's been, it's been a long journey. Um, when I became minister, I did review all the reports I've come in. Samu Bremudia report, Emeka Omera, I can go on and on. Up until 2016, when we had the National Reforms Committee report, which kind of extrayed all the reports that had looked at the sports development in the country. I think that we have the right ideas, but then the question of implementation has become a major problem. Beyond that, funding. Because some of the ideas I've seen are brilliant. For instance, let me give you. We say, oh, we need to have X number of facilities developed, maintained over the years. There's an X budget for it. If there's no funding, nothing happens. So this is what we've decided to do. We've decided to take the 2016 reforms, National Reform Committee. That was set up by the former minister, uh, Barrister Solomon Dalong. He had about 12 eminent sportsmen and women. We intend to set up a smaller committee that will be called the Implementation Committee that will take this up and then we'll look at, we, we'll break it down into three clear stages. What are the major priorities? And I, I told you, the whole development will be centered around the three I's and one P. There's no departure from it. 
We talk about infrastructure, with the infrastructural rationalization, facilities, <coughs> equipping these facilities, maintaining them, and managing them. Then you talk about investment. We need massive investment on the part of government, almost like a Marshall Plan, a one-time Marshall Plan, and then a turnover to the private sector. We want to see um, a regime in which private individuals are owning clubs, private individuals are building stadiums, just like we have in other countries. Our domestic league, for instance, we want to look at it. We're going to unbundle it completely. Right now, we have 92% of the clubs owned by, by governments, state governments. Mm. That does not all go well at all for the development of domestic league. We're going to take a stab at that. So we're going to break it down to three stages, have the committee look at implementable chunks, and we'll match that with the resources that we have. It's like building a house. You need a foundation. A few times we've tried to put on more on the roof yeah. without... The foundation cannot sustain it. So eventually, like I said, we want to end up, go beyond just the national sports policy. The current one is under review. But we're expanding the scope to include, you know, sports as a business. That's why we're talking about the national sports industry policy. Mm. What are we doing to uh, get more women involved in sports in Nigeria? Well, I think the, the opportunities uh, for the women to be involved in sport is also the same opportunities that the men have. But uh, perhaps I could also say that in October, the Ministry of Women Affairs, Ministry of uh, Trade Investment, um, the Ministry of Youth and Sports Development, mm. and uh, Special Duties actually had a meeting trying to bring a bit of gender bias into sports development trying to look at how we can keep our girls longer in school yeah. by engaging them in sports yeah. so they don't go into early marriage yeah. or early lining of trade. We're also trying to target the funds that FIFA, CAF, and others have yeah. that is gender-focused. Stay with it. And stay with it. Yeah. So that process is ongoing. But we're trying to create linkages uh, with uh, other ministries so that we can have that push and eventually go forward to FIFA go forward to CAF to say, well, this is the plan we have. We want to plug into the funds that you have. And I agree with you. Uh, we need to, you know, pay very close attention to um, the girls, the young girls, yeah. and also the women in sports development. I must say thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for making our time to come on the show. There's still so much to talk about, and Twitter, Facebook, social media is buzzing. So we do this quarterly. Every three months we get you, <laughs> see that you talk about this or this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Austin, time. for having me. Thank you so much. Thank That's you. it. Uh, the Honorable Minister for Youth and Sports Development, Mr. Sunday Dari, talking about sports development in Nigeria. I'm getting those messages. Let's keep them coming on Twitter, channels, underscore sports, Facebook channels, I think sports. That's the show for the team. I'm Austin Okonakwan. In everything you do, remember, keep talking sports. Bye for now. <laughs>